Hello, and welcome to another installment of FIT Talks, the oral history program of the Fashion Institute of Technology, one of 64 campuses of the State University of New York. I'm James Ferguson, Special Collections Associate and Curator for the College Archives. We're coming to you today from the FIT campus on West 27th Street and 7th Avenue in Manhattan. It is May 15th, 2024, and the time is 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I have the honor and privilege to be joined today by Professor Robert Vassilotti of the Fashion Business Management Department. Professor Vassilotti, welcome to the program, and thank you for participating. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I think it's a wonderful program. And I know it's been going on for several years, and I can imagine you have a wealth of these type of uh, interviews uh, archived now. And I think it's a great way to build the history of our campus and our museum and our special collections. So I'm, a part, I'm very happy to be part of it. And I thank you again for, for inviting me and doing the work that you guys do. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we're delighted to have you participate. Uh, for context, would you please tell researchers a little about your childhood and upbringing? Sure. Um, I'd also like to point out that you pronounced my name beautifully. Oh, why, thank you. Thank you so much, Vasilavi. Yes. So, yeah, my childhood and upbringing. Yeah, I, put, I pulled out a version of the 1950 Vogue magazine here um, that you have on your collections, uh, July of 1950. So you can do the math. It's, I'll be 74 soon. And, um, you know, I tell you, I, I have to say that I've been very privileged to have a really, really interesting childhood and upbringing. And it, it was kind of classic in many ways. And, and, you know, I know so many people have not had that privilege, but, um, you know, it was kind of suburban Long Island in the 1950s after World War II, and everything was changing and everything was fresh and new. And, you know, we lived in the suburbs. Um, I'm half Italian and half Polish, 50-50. Both families came from Richmond Hill, Queens, and they were the first to emigrate and leave to Long Island, a whole 12 miles away from Queens, you know, and the relatives all thought they were crazy going to Long Island, what's out there, you know. Well, we were fortunate enough to move into a town called Garden City, which is a historical town, it goes back to 1869. And my dad bought land and built a house and um, I was, we moved out, I was a year old, so I basically, you know, recall Garden City from my childhood. Uh, and uh, in Queens, we would go back almost every Sunday to visit the Polish side or the Italian side for those Sunday meals and those kinds of things, so I know Queens as well. Um, but Garden City is a very special place. It, it was founded by Alexander Turney Stewart, who was a retail merchant and, and founded the first department store in, in New York City and he became like a billionaire in his day. And a lot of people don't know the Stewart Company, the A2 Stewart uh, Company, but it was massive. His department store was called the Marble Palace um, and he decided to build a town called Garden City in 1869. He planned it and built uh, streets and roads and, and, and sidewalks and lights and he built the cathedral and a school, and, and it's a really amazing historical community. And so I had the privilege of being raised there. My dad was struggling to live there. He was a teacher in the New York City school system. I guess that's where I get a little of my teaching, but he was he was a industrial arts woodwork teacher. That's where I get my creative side. And um, I love woodwork. I'm a woodworker myself, and I've cr crafted many, many things in my life, and I, I love to work with wood. I have all the old tools from my, my father, my grandfather. My grandfather on my Italian side was a master cabinet maker and inlay maker, and he could make his own moldings and trim, and very, very talented man, came from Italy. Uh, my grandfather on the Polish side was a plumber, and, and he ended up being a steam fitter for the Long Island Railroad for many, many years, and they both were very well off, and they both had thriving careers, though they struggled and worked hard. Um, they were fortunate because they, they my, my grandfather on the Vassilotti side, you know, Pasquale, he had a, a cabinet shop and a home building shop on Van Wyck Expressway and he had his own business there and um, the other fellow, like I said, worked, for, you know, he was a union man working for uh, the railroad in the, um, as a steam fitter and that was all steam in those days, locomotives and things. So I have all the tools of all of those people, I dabble in all those things. I could do electrical work, carpentry work and plumbing work. And I love it all, and I love to paint. 
So I'm a very, very handy guy. And part of, part of the interesting thing about my life is that, you know, I learned from so many people because I came from two big families. I have one sister, older, always learned from her. She's brilliant. She's great. She was always in the honor roll. And, and I learned a lot from her. And she still lives nearby in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania. But my sister, Judy. And I learned so much from aunts and uncles. I had big families. My mother was one of 15. My father was one of five. All of them had trades. All of them had skills, uh, particularly the guys and, you know, in those days. Um, and they all had to work hard. My father was one of the few who went to college. His other brother, two, excuse me, his two other brothers went to college, three of them. On my mother's side, no one went to college. And so they all worked hard. Um, and, you know, I learned skills from all of them. And I have these same skills today. So I was really happy to learn from them. Uh, they all used to read the newspapers. I learned stories from them. And, you know, funny thing that I was one of the only boy cousins. All the rest were girl cousins. So when we get these big parties, you know, I, I got a lot of attention from everybody because I was the only boy running around, you know. <laughs> but, I, and, but I also spent time with them when they did projects. And they would all help each other repair homes and fix each other's houses, and they were all moving to the suburbs. So, you know, we spent a lot of that family time. Um, so growing up, again, I, was, I felt fairly uh, comfortable in that environment. I, I grew up on a block with lots of kids in the 50s. Moms were home, kids were out playing, we played all day. Um, beautiful place to grow up, uh, Wellington Road, Garden City. Um, Again, it's such a historical, classic town that uh, it, it's really worth visiting someday. Um, I'm trying to preserve a building in that town right now that goes back to 1878 that was built in memoriam for Alexander Turney Stewart, who founded the town. Uh, there's a cathedral there that's spectacular. But that building, we're fighting now for 40 years to save that building. Wow. Imagine this. And so we're really uh, working hard to save it, and we think we're just about there. Um, I've been involved for like 20 years on this building, maybe close to 30, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and um, I'm dating myself again. But the reality is that, you know, it's worth saving. It's a classic boys' school. There was a boys' school and a girls' school and a cathedral. It was really planned. At any rate, um, growing up in the, in the neighborhood, we all played outside all day long, uh, spent a lot of time outside. I have a love of nature. Growing up in the beaches of Long Island, um, learned to swim in the ocean and, and the saltwater pools of Jones Beach. Um, it, it, it was just, uh, you know, a really great time to grow up. Um, and, of course, you know, I went to school uh, a couple of years up in Massachusetts, uh, college that is, um, small college. Um, my, my high school grades were only average. I went to a small college called American International College up in Springfield, Massachusetts for two years as a dorm student and majoring in business and <clears throat> eventually uh, came back to Long Island, <clears throat> transferred back and took some courses at NASA Community, a, a, a school that we have now, part of mm -hmm. SUNY, um, NASA Community College. I took some courses at CW Post, which is now Long Island University, kind of transitioning in those days. This was the you know, the wild 60s and 70s. And, um, you know, my, my college year was supposed to, I was supposed to graduate in 72. I ended up graduating in 75, because in those days, a lot of us took gap years and time off and things like that, as I did. And I worked many different jobs. And um, uh, I, I enjoyed all the experimenting of different schools and different jobs. And I got to tell you, all that moving around to different schools, before computers was really good because I learned how to understand the systems and registering. And so years later when I came here, I was so good at helping students understand their schedules, how to transfer, how to register, how to, what courses to take. Um, it came in immensely important. We didn't have an advisement office at mm -hmm. FIT. So we would see students constantly. And so I had to help students a lot like that. Um, so those years you know, helped me uh, gain that knowledge. Little did I know. Um, I ended up transferring to Hofstra, majoring in business there, and, and graduating with a business degree with honors, unlike high school. <laughs> and then, um, uh, you know, after, well, actually I was, 
I started working with Bloomingdale's during the summer of 72. When it, Bloomingdale's opened in my town in Garden City. It's one of their first branch stores in many, many years in those days. It sounds crazy, but they hadn't opened a store in decades. And so they opened a new store uh, designed by architect Darrell Stone on Franklin Avenue. Franklin Avenue in Garden City, again, Garden City has this history. Garden City, Franklin Avenue was like the Fifth Avenue of Long Island in its day. And it had all these department stores along there. Saks, Lord & Taylor's, uh, Abraham and Strauss, uh, Lozier's, uh, and uh, I, I can't even think of them all right now. And then, of course, Bloomingdale's came along. And so this was the place where, you know, ladies lunched. Just like in the old days of Fifth Avenue, they'd come there and they'd spend all day and go to the different restaurants, and the restaurants were spectacular. Um, so Bloomingdale's 1972, this store was absolutely spectacular. I started a month before the store opened, saw how the store came together, met all kinds of people from the corporate offices, every kind of VP, every kind of advertising person, merchandising person, buyer, divisional, GMM, president, you know, who is this person, regional. Uh, visual people, you name it, and and so here I am, a salesperson, going. This place is cool. You know, this place has a lot going on, and there's an opportunity here, maybe. You know, so I started working there as a salesman in men's uh, dress furnishings, and really loved all the people I worked for. I worked with some great managers, and all of them were striving quite diligently to get ahead, and. Um, I was going to school at night, <clears throat> finishing my bachelor's, <clears throat> and then I went into their training program, and my core was in menswear, and I was an associate buyer and started buying in menswear and you know men's uh, tailored clothing, and uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, got to meet all kinds of people. Uh, Calvin Klein himself used to show us the line directly to the buyers at Bloomingdale's. Ralph Lauren used to show us the line because we were so new, and I got to work in the first Ralph Lauren menswear shop in the country that was set up in 59th Street Bloomingdale's. You know, it was like a shop within a shop, beautifully decorated and the decor was stunning. And Ralph had a lot to do with the decor. And um, so I worked in that shop and, you know, the media was there. They were coming around every day taking pictures and um, it was a big thing. In, in fact, uh, Jackie Onassis used to shop there with John John, her little kid. Um, but it was a very good experience to work in that shop and the, uh, the focus that was on that menswear because menswear was emerging into designers. You know, designers were hitting men's for the very first time. So I got to experience all of that um, and be on the cutting edge of that at, at, at Bloomingdale's. It was such a great store. I mean, I worked with them for 13 years. Um, little did I know a summer job would turn into this 13-year career. But I, I never forget the advice of one of the personnel directors when she said to me, Mr. Vassilotti, there's a future here if you want it, and I think you're right for it. And I looked at her and said, thank you. And she goes, and also I want you to join the retirement plan. <laughs> so I did. And so, you know, all those years later it was great because after 13 years, you know, you have investments and you're vested in everything and you, you have a, a, a kind of a retirement nest egg built up, you know. But um, so, you know, Bloomingdale's, it was part of Federated Department Stores in those days. Federated Department Stores had 29 major department stores across the country, uh, from uh, Lazarus to Verdines to Bullocks in California to, um, uh, you had um, iMagnon and Foley's and Hex and all these companies. Um, and uh, Jordan Marsh out of Boston, you name it, Abraham and Strauss. So, it's interesting, in 1929, Federated was formed on a yacht in the Long Island Sound by a bunch of the CEOs at the time who decided to combine buying power to create Federated Store. If we can buy together, we'll get even better price, right? Because the more the quantity goes up, the price comes down. We can all buy it together. Well, that was great. So the Federated buying teams, now you know, I'm a buyer, uh, we'd go to all these uh, conferences and trade shows and things and people would be buying you know the group buy and Bloomingdale's would be like I don't want the group buy <laughs> we want to do something different and so we were the rebels and it was very difficult because Federated wanted to buy all of these shirts from this company or that company and do all these programs because the price and we were like no we don't want to be part of it so Bloomingdale's became this you know very different 
you know, cutting edge kind of company that always want to do things different. And we'd go to the vendors and say, hey, can you change that shirt a little bit? We want it this way, we want it that way. And can mm -hmm. you do this and can you do that? And they would do it for us. So you, it would be amazing. You'd be on a buying trip overseas and you could ask a, a buyer for a sample, a, a vendor for a sample, and they'd have the sample the next day wow. for you, you know, brought to the hotel. And they want your business. So it was a really interesting time to work for uh, that company. And um, uh, I also worked in housewares. So I, I got to know a, a divisional in housewares. And uh, there was an opportunity to move into a buying job there. And I said, well, it's a department store. You got to know everything in a department store. So menswear, you know, women's wear, housewares, I'll go with the housewares. So great idea. I became a gourmet cookware buyer. And the thing about buying is interesting, right? If, unless you're into something really specialized like jewelry, uh, um, a few other things, you can learn to buy anything, you know, and to be a buyer for it. Because it's managing it and it's selecting and it's planning and it's, you know, you're doing your six month plan and your quantities. So I fell in love with housewares. I'm, I'm, I'm a very houseware type of guy. Like, I'm a very domesticated guy. I've always learned how to cook, I always knew how to, you know, help my wife in the kitchen, you know. Um, I was married when I was 23. And so I always helped at home in the kitchen, you know. And so I loved all this stuff about the kitchen and cooking and stuff. And so Bloomingdale's was on the cutting edge of gourmet cookware. The cookware was really taking off. And all these chefs were coming on board and, um, uh, 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 you know, Beard and, and Prudhomme and all these people were have cooking shows and books and, and all these kinds of things, James Beard and things. And so we had a gourmet shop with live demonstrations and big sales every week and high-end cookware like Calphalon and Old Clad. People hadn't even heard of these things. All the high-end knives, Henkels and Wustoff and uh, the, the consumer was just gobbling it up. They wanted all the best kitchens to show off their, you know, brand new home in the 80s. It was the opulence of the 80s, you know, and the big money of the 80s and things. And the women were wearing the power shoulders, you know, to work and everything. And so they wanted the best in their kitchen to impress their friends, even if they couldn't cook a fried egg, you know. They had the best pans. And so, and they had gorgeous copper pans that they would hang on the racks. The, the whole thing was the hanging racks and cookware and things. So, the trends that I've lived through are just amazing. Uh, menswear with all the designers coming in, menswear was boring. It was, you know, white shirts, blue shirts, and ecru color shirts, right? Mm -hmm. And um, rep stripe ties and uh, everything, you know, penny loafers and oxfords, and then all of a sudden, poof, the designers came in. You know, we were selling, you know, Cacharelle and, 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 and uh, you know, Calvin Klein and, and others and, and Pierre Cardin and we couldn't keep the Pierre Cardin suits and, and clothing and ties and shirts in stock and Yves Saint Laurent. So we were at, I, I was at this juncture where, you know, men's wear exploded and I was there to see it and feel it and be part of it and, and guide it actually. Um, and we were also opening stores at Bloomingdale's. You know, I, Garden City was one of the first but then we continued to open stores in Chicago and in Washington and um, uh, Florida and, and just all over, you know, and it was really an amazing time to be expanding stores and traveling and I got to buy things all over Europe, travel with the group to Europe. It was, it was, it was really fantastic. Um, and again, I hit that boom of the cookware industry, the gourmet cookware blossoming. Uh, we used to have a restaurant right in the housewares department at Bloomingdale's 59th Street. Uh, it was called La Trend Bleu, mm -hmm. and you would walk upstairs and it would be this beautiful restaurant, like an old French railway car, it was fantastic, and we'd go to lunch there all the time, it was great. I was also very privileged to live through the era of like unlimited expenses, okay? <laughs> Vendors were going crazy, there was no like things with the IRS and you know, all these kinds of things, and gee, you better take the beer off the receipt before you put it in for the expense account. It was. You know, everyone was taking everyone to lunch, taking, giving them movie theater tickets, not movie theater, pl tickets to plays and concerts and all these kind of things. But it was all up and up, it really was. And, and it was just the way of the business world, you know. All the vendors were local primarily. There was not a lot of overseas business at the time. Most of it came out of Europe. That's why I traveled to Europe extensively. And then eventually China was the big push and we started bringing domestic, excuse me, 
imports in rather than just domestic goods, and the imports were coming in in container loads, overwhelming our warehouses, I might add. We weren't ready for the influx of um, foreign trade like we started to buy, and so it became a problem. Our warehouses became outdated. Uh, it was very difficult to um, uh, move the goods through our warehouses and our trucking systems. We had to change everything. Uh, because when you get 20 or 40 foot containers, it's a lot of merchandise. So, um, yeah, I lived through some very strange and changing times, right? We didn't have mm -hmm. computers. We had, then we moved on to computer systems, and that became a whole challenge in the buying world. We used to get selling reports that were two feet thick of paper, right, that you had to look through, right. and piles of computer paper printed out with all your numbers. It was crazy. I used to bring shopping bags of paper home double up the bags and carry two shopping bags with paperwork home on the weekends and stuff. It was crazy times. But the, the computers are spitting out the material and the information, but it wasn't a screen at your desk, so you had to get the printed copy. Mm -hmm. It was a little bizarre. But um, so let's see. I le in, somewhere in the 80s, I left, uh, mid-80s, I left Bloomingdale's. Um, one, one of the vice presidents at Bloomingdale's, uh, had moved on to become the president of Gimbel's, believe it or not, and so he was recruiting. I went to Gimbel's uh, as an assistant store manager, and a good pay increase is why I went. And, you know, for a change, you know, I'd been there 13 years. So I had a young family. I have two daughters. They were growing up, and uh, I have a, w a lovely wife from, uh, from Greece, my wife Effie, and uh, my daughters, Christina and Julia. So they were, they were growing up, and I said, He's going to pay me a lot more money. I'm going to go, and I love the guy. So I'm going to work there. And, and I knew Bloomingdale's from the high end. Gimbel's was low end, kind of um, rock'em, sock'em mm -hmm. retailing, pilot high, let it fly, as we used to say. And they had one-day sales. And oh, my God, did they have one-day sales. It was like unheard of. On a Wednesday, they had this once a month. They had this insane sale with the price is ridiculous. The crowds came in. You could be trampled by the crowds. The lines at the register were 40 and 50 people long. And I'm not kidding. They were sitting on chairs waiting in line. It was crazy times. But guess what? After 144 years, Gimbel's goes out of business. Why? Because of a bunch of thieves stealing truckloads of merchandise. They were stealing truckloads of merchandise out of their warehouses here. And they couldn't figure out how or why it was happening. A new company had bought Gimbel's, and they did not know how to control it. It was, uh, it was a tobacco company, British American Tobacco, bought them out, but they didn't know how to run the company. Mm -hmm. But British American Tobacco really didn't care, B-A-T, because they wanted the land mm -hmm. that these stores sat upon to give influx to their tobacco business. So that's what happened. Suddenly I'm finding myself out of a job. I'm like, what? And they said, well, stay to the end. We need people to close the store. We'll give you a bonus. I said, oh, okay. I'll stay to the end. After that, now I can look for a job. I go out, I get my job. As soon as I leave that company, boom, I already locked in a job with Abraham and Strauss, a sister store federate. They hired me as a divisional merchandise manager. If you think it was easy to interview with Abraham and Strauss, you have another guest coming. I interviewed with nine people over three days. Three, three, and three. Got the job, met the CEO, everything else. I was there for 10 years. They like to pick people who fit with the company. I always say to my students, make sure you have a fit with the company. If you don't feel comfortable, don't even start the job. If you feel like you fit with the company, start the job. And that's what they did. They, they, was, they did not have a lot of turnover there. People loved to work there. And the customers recognized that too. The customers recognized that people who were here loved their job. And we all liked their job. So I love working there. I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot from people at Bloomingdale's. Don't forget, I used to be in meetings all the time with Marvin Traub, one of the great retailers of all time. He wrote a book called Like No Other, Like No Other Store. It was his expression. It's still an expression at Bloomingdale's today, Like No Other. Very demanding guy. Lester Gribetz in Home Furnishings and, and uh, Carl Levine. Um, these were tough guys, right? Um, a, a fellow named Jerry Applebaum. I mean, you know, they wanted blood from a stone. That's what we used to say, right? And so you learned a lot from these people. You know, you learned a lot from people. I, you know, I worked for a fellow named Jack Schultz. He was so demanding. He was demanding on himself. He had a nervous breakdown right in our department one day. That's how stressed he was. So Bloomingdale's is a high-stress place. Perhaps why I wanted to also move to Gimbel's. And then after Gimbel's, I went to ANS 10 years there. And all the time, my salary was increasing, not bad. And I still had federated, so I had the profit share with Abraham and Strauss. 
So by the time I left Abraham Strauss, I had 24 years of accumulated um, investments with Federated, and I took a job at uh, Nautica Menswear, because why? Abraham Strauss was merged out by Macy's. Macy's came in as a Federated member, one of the 29 stores, mm -hmm. but immediately it all became Macy's. So they gobbled up everything. You saw the writing on the wall, everyone was like, you better find the job, because Macy's is coming in. And we, um, it, it was funny, I was, I was at Abraham and Strauss when um, uh, we took over Jordan Marsh out of Boston. It was all part of the plan. We took them over. Jordan Marsh disappears after all these years. People were all upset. And then Macy's comes into Federer, it takes us all over. And I literally worked for Macy's for about a month. <laughs> and so, interestingly enough, as the world turns, mm. um, years later, and it looks so funny on paper, but years later they said, you know, you'll be entitled to a, um, a pension plan with Macy's, you know, when you, when you reach the age of 66. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> and so sure enough, when I turned 66, you know, some letter comes in the mail, <laughs> you know, don't forget, you still have a Macy's pension plan you're entitled to. And so... I mean, what does it pay for? It pays for something, you know, I don't even know anymore. I guess it's like a monthly payment on my automobile, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that. So, um, it is, and it's funny because I'm still fully employed, but I, I get this Macy's thing, you know? And so, um, anyway, so working for Nautica, I only stay there a little while, I, I'm just under a year. I was an account rep for Nautica. First time on the wholesale side. I'm a, I'm a retail merchant, managerial merchant, through and through, buyer through and through, um, and uh, uh, at Nautica it was a whole different perspective. Now I'm servicing Macy's, servicing Strawbridge and Clothers, mm -hmm. servicing Bloomingdale's, you know, on the account side, teaching the, you know, the team about the product and the product line and what's coming in and, and how the floor should be merchandised. And, and Nautica was great. Nautica was run by David Chu and founded by David Chu as an FIT graduate. Um, his, his nautical inspirations came from his family who, um, they were nautical engineers and they designed oh. sailboats and things and that's why he got all these colors and numbers from the sails and things that he would do. Um, we met him of course, met him, he would be there all the time and, and he would talk to us about the line and uh, they used a lot of artwork in their brochures which was beautiful, I loved that. Um, but anyway, so uh, I had this idea <laughs> about teaching and it was in the back of my mind ever since my dad. My dad always used to say, be a teacher, be a teacher, why don't you be a teacher? You get the, you know, you get the summer off, you can do what you want, you're a little more free, you don't have to stay late in the afternoon, you can do after school programs and whatever you want to do. And so he loved the freedom, like he, he was a, he, he did uh, real estate on the side and he also built homes. So he built like three homes in Garden City, contracted, you know, as a contractor. He sold homes all over town and neighboring towns and communities. He was an independent real estate broker not a sales, but a real estate broker, and um, had gotten his license and everything. Um, and uh, he went to a SUNY school. He went to Oswego, upstate New York. In those days, that was a big thing, okay? In like the 30s or 40s or whatever it was, I think it was the 40s, he would go to, he went to Oswego out of Queens. You know, it was like a big thing in those days. But, um, and he served in the military. He had to go to school late because he was in the military for, um, you know, like four years. Um, but uh, all of them were in the military. Uh, he never went overseas, thankfully. But, um, so yeah, um, the uh, uh, experience I had at Nautica was, was excellent, but I, something was in my mind about this idea of wanting to learn more. I wanted to learn more. And um, I was getting like mentally bored, you know, and it was troubling me immensely. Uh, and I knew there was a career change, a, and a radical one, imminent, you know, and I, and I would be at work thinking about it, like distracted from my work, you know, thinking about something's got to be next. And so something was driving me towards this idea of giving back and teaching I, this idea. And so I started sending out feelers to different schools and say, can I teach retail? Can I teach retail? Can I teach retail management, retail buying, retail merchandising? Where do I go? And I was sending all these feelers out, and little did I, I kind of discover, you know, FIT. And, but that took a while to get to FIT. I went to all these other colleges and universities on Long Island first and things. And in those days, again, there was no, it was all letters and phone calls, mm -hmm. letters and phone calls. And um, I really buckled down and started doing my research and stuff. And 
uh, contacting all kinds of people, and um, suddenly I came across uh, a fellow, John Mincarelli, a Didi Valentini. John Mincarelli was one of the faculty. He has left and retired, uh, and he uh, he created the graduate program for FBM. Um, and uh, Didi Valentini was the chair at the time, and I spoke to both of them on the phone, and then we went in and met them, even before I applied to HR. And I had great conversations with them. And um, uh, they said, you're perfect, you'd be a great adjunct. Why don't you start, you know, come in and start. And so I did. <laughs> and so I started in the January of 97, and worked six months as an adjunct with like three courses. I was supposed to take two, and then they, they threw another one at me or something. You know? Anyway, mm -hmm. it was a very crazy semester. And then um, there was a job opening for full time. I applied for it. And they were really looking for full timers because a lot of people were retiring. So I kind of had proven myself in the six months. I was going to every committee meeting. I was meeting everybody. Um, in those days, I would come in all dressed up in a suit and a tie and everything. And like now, everyone's walking around so casual, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it was, and I brought a lot to the table at the time. So I was hired as full-time faculty. It was in the summer of 97, a year before Joyce Brown started, interestingly enough. And um, I met some amazing people here. Uh, Elaine Stone, who wrote the, the mm -hmm. core book of the fashion merchandising program, Dynamics of Fashion. Elaine Stone was here. And... Um, uh, it was really a good time to be part of FBM and fashion buying, fashion buying and merchandising. Now it's fashion merchandising management. Our name has changed a few times, mm -hmm. but um, so yeah, uh, FIT. My God, suddenly I leave this other career and now I'm here 27 years. Right, I'm here 27 years. This is crazy. But I just finished my 27th year this May. Uh, so what's happening here is all these opportunities start opening up, right? I'm networking with people that are spectacular. I love working with all these people, like great minds and creative. And I really felt at home here. And so I started meeting all kinds of people, getting very involved. Next thing you know, I become assistant chair of the department. I was assistant chair for six years. And again, in those days, without advisement, you saw students all day long, like all day long, to help them with their coursework and courses and everything, just nonstop. And um, it was challenging, actually. And so um, things kept opening up as opportunities. But at the same time, I was like almost guilty. I'm like, here I am calling myself a professor. And I haven't really earned the right. you know. And so I decided to go back to school. And I went to uh, a Teachers College at Columbia University. And I went in a master's program at the time. And it was for computing, communication, technology, and education. Right when we didn't, right when we really were on the cusp of all of those things hitting the world of education, like learning mm -hmm. modules, you know, like Blackboard and Brightspace, all that was new. In fact, Columbia was developing their own systems, and I, you know, I worked in their lab where they were developing some of these systems and things. And um, I had great professors there. It was a great program. It was a very new program at, at uh, Teachers College. Um, and I was so inspired to be there. And the funny part was I, I, I only tested it. I took like one course one semester and one course the next semester. I didn't even apply to Columbia. I took them as what they call non-degree student, mm -hmm. but for credit. So each course was three credits, three credits took the courses and I said, you know what, I love this place. I spoke to an advisor, he said, apply to the college. Look, you're doing well. You love these courses. You know, I know you, you've been in my course. The other fellows, I know you, you've been in my course. Apply to the program. I'm sure you'll get accepted. I got accepted. They, they gave me letters of recommendation. And um, I was always good at networking. I would, I would network at Hofstra. I would network at all my schools. Um, Hofstra got to know the dean of the school at, at Hofstra University, you know, Hal Lazarus and things. And so it, it would help to get to know people. But um, uh, Columbia was a great experience. And, 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 you know, the amount of reading things you had to do was immense. Team projects. Um, they were doing experimental things at the time, which was unheard of. Like we had class, and half the class was remote. Half the class wasn't even there. And we had to go on. In the early days of computer mm -hmm. communications, Commu com communicate with these students who are off campus as a team. It was challenging, right? It was really challenging. And so it was a great experience because all of that stuff was about to happen. 
you know, mainstream at all campuses. And so it was a great, great major to take. Um, during that time, I was uh, asked by Dario Cortez, the VP of Academic Affairs. Uh, we had a dean who left, and, and Dario was named the acting dean of business and technology. But Dario was on the ninth floor as vice president of academic affairs, dual role. So he said, can you sit on the fourth floor and be the acting assistant dean for School of Business? So I said, sure. <laughs> Little did I know it would be two and a half years later. So it was a two and a half year, five semester kind of thing. And uh, it was an exciting time to be doing that, however, because I got to know all the chair people of the business and technology department. Um, it was at a time where we were trying to figure out uh, the naming of the Baker School. We had just gotten the $10 million mm -hmm. to the uh, Baker School, and uh, that included you know $2 million of scholarships. And we were going to have a launch event, so we had to kind of bring the school up to code and do a lot of things to physically change the hallways and the space and the offices and the, it's before we had the launch party with them coming to campus and everything. So there was a couple of summers of, not, uh, it was one big summer of craziness and when we renovated everything in an entire fall we were renovating spaces and things. I've been involved in a tremendous amount of classroom renovations and in new classroom designs working with uh, Takashi Kamaya from uh, Interior Design uh, long before we did these things more formally, but we were changing physical classrooms and doing all kinds of things to our classrooms at the time. Uh, we also had that same two and a half year time period, and we of course had the launch party, and the Baker Scholars program evolved. Uh, also during that two years, we were planning with shop architects the fourth, fifth, and sixth floor renovations of Dubinsky. Mm -hmm. Now, Dubinsky used to have two floors of, uh, they had a kitchen, they had two floors with cafeterias, a commuter cafeteria and a resident cafeteria and the kitchen, and all that was coming out. But the, the plan for us academically was, okay guys, you have 10 programs, what do your programs need in the way of new labs? So I had to go to all the chairs, we had plans spread out on my desk for months, uh, and we worked with shop architects to decide, okay, this is what we have. And textiles, this is what we need. This is what we have, this is what we need, whether it's classroom, lab, storage, technical things, equipment. So I was really deep diving into every single major. It was an amazing time. Um, and we came up with the, all the plans to give to shop and say, okay, guys, build it. <laughs> you know, this is our needs. You figure it out. And they came out beautiful, quite frankly. Those three floors are really spectacular. Um, and, and they were doing the same thing on the art and design side, don't forget, you know, which I didn't have anything to do with that. Toy design and others, they were doing the same thing. What do we have? What do we need? Let's deliver a package to shop and they'll make it all happen. So, um, and from that there was also some spin-off that was leading towards C squared, the new building on 28th. Uh, other, other ideas that would follow suit uh, there for technical classrooms. I was involved with a, co uh, a committee that was planning all the uh, basic lecture uh, techno uh, classrooms for tech with technology for like business uh, students and liberal arts students. And so we have a few of those classes in Feldman now, third floor and fifth floor, that are new model rooms for something that's going to be in the 28th Street building. Um, I love working here. The, the, the opportunities here have been uh, uh, just tremendous. Um, I was also selected and chosen, well, there's a reason, but to be the uh, co-chair of the Sustainability Council when the president formed the Sustainability Council, mm -hmm. myself and Grashna Pilatovich from Interior Design. But there was a reason I was selected, but the reason was because myself, Artie Feldman, Grashna Pilatovich, um, um, Georgia Kalibas, we got together and we were all concerned about sustainability on this campus and saw nothing happening. So we got together, we formed, formed a faculty committee in the Senate, and, and we started to create a conference, and we got support financially from the deans, and we did that for like a couple of years. We had two conferences which were spectacularly successful, and then we got the president more involved, more involved, more involved, and she eventually went to the uh, Clinton Global Initiative and we inspired her to do that. And then our students have also been competing there and, and successful and winning things. Mm -hmm. So when she came back, she was very motivated. And she made a commitment to start the council. And the council would have grants. The council would have a conference. The council would have Sustainable Awareness Week. 
it would have so many members, and it would have um, a website, and, and all these kinds of things. And so um, the grant program was spectacular. It was a very big success. And I was with that committee as co-chair for six years and as a member for nine years. And so I helped to plan uh, like 11 of those conferences. And now we're up to the 18th. Um, and I'm kind of a, you know, uh, an ex-member or emeritus or whatever you want to call it of the mm -hmm. Sustainability Council. So I was very honored to be a win an award in 2023, uh, last, uh, last April at the uh, conference, uh, Changemaker Award. Sustainability Council Changemaker Award. The president presented it at the conference with uh, Grajna also was there and Sandy Krasovic and Naomi Kleinman, also people who were responsible for the conferences. And um, they were very, very instrumental in making those conferences happen and planning out the layout of Reeves Hall. And we were one of the first groups that really started to use Reeves Hall. Because it was new. Reeves Hall was new. What do you do with it, right? So I, it was a struggle figuring out how to use it and how to set it up. Sandy and Nomi and others were really instrumental. We all worked on the floor plans to figure out how to lay it out, how to set it up. It was a one-day conference. We used all the seminar rooms on the main floor, all the seminar rooms on the lower level. And it was an amazingly well-coordinated conference. Um, so I think I have to be really proud to be part of that uh, initiative that's still going on here. And, and will continue to go on, I'm sure, for years to come. Uh, but we are, I'm also happy that we were able to execute the mission statement of FIT to reflect the, na the words sustainability, global citizens, and diversity and inclusion into our mission statement. And that happened, I'll be honest with you, um, <laughs> I was serving on the middle states uh, as co-chair of the Middle States uh, 2012 uh, report. And the Middle States, it was my second time serving on Middle States. And so um, the first time was the periodic review. It was, it was the 2007 the periodic review for Middle States. And I was co-chair with Dibna Bowles from Curriculum and Instruction. And we had to put together you know, the 100-page report, how are we doing as a campus. After that went in, before you know it, the 10-year periodic review 2012 comes up. I'm asked again to participate in that, co-chair that committee with her. And so as we were co-chairing and working with all the VPs and, and directors and chairs of the, of the campus, I couldn't help but bring up the fact that our mission statement was really getting old and sour and needed a, 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 some life. And so um, it was then that, you know, I seriously suggested these core principles be involved in this mission. And so through the work of the committee, we, we phrased it out and we got it approved by the president, of course, and the board, and we redid the mission statement of the campus. And so working on two middle states was an amazing experience, okay? Mm -hmm. Coordinating eight teams to come up with a they don't want it more than about 100 pages, but our first reports were a couple of hundred pages, and we had to color down to 100. And both times we went through with flying colors, you know, with no problems whatsoever. You know, thumbs up, you got your accreditation, everything's good, we love you guys. Do this, do that, we love you guys, you're good. Um, I was asked a third time, and I respectfully declined. Uh, some others took it off. But it would have been too much. And I, I, I knew when to step away from, from that moment. And I'll be honest with you, I'm going to tell you something else I stepped away from. Uh, when I was assistant dean, uh, there were people telling me, you know, Vassalotti, we'd love you to be the dean. Put your application in, because, you know, we want it. They want the dean. Mm -hmm. But it had been a crazy two and a half years. And at the same time, I was missing the classroom and I was missing the students. I was still teaching, you know, part time, because at night, you know, I would have mm -hmm. classes. But I, I still loved the classroom. And I love that experience. So I stepped away. It was a big decision. But I will say another thing. Mm -hmm. As assistant dean, when I was asked to be assistant dean, there was no assistant dean on the campus of FIT. It was a new position. No one even knew what I was stepping into. I didn't know what I was stepping into. It was something that was just made up in the spot. Dario Cortez created the idea of the assistant dean. He says, campuses all over America have assistant deans. Dario Cortez was also instrumental in changing the names of the divisions 
of the school of business and the division of art design to schools. He says, we should have school. You know, it's the school of continuing education. Mm-hmm. It's the school of graduate studies. It's the school of business. And he changed those things. But he also started to say, why don't we have some titles on this campus that make sense as well, academically? So Vassalite, I want you to be my assistant dean. I was like, assistant dean? He goes, yes. So now we have assistant deans. So quite, but at that time, I actually had to help write the job description, you know. But the reality was, um, and they didn't know quite what to do. So I, you know, at some point I was getting release time. And then another semester I got bonus. And another release time. It was, it was, they didn't know how to deal with my, you know, salary structure and release time and stuff. It was all mm-hmm. kind of unknown. But at the same time, it all worked out, and I was very happy to participate in that opportunity. I learned so much from working with all the chairs, 10 chairs over two and a half years. It was crazily wow. informative, you know. So, um, yeah, uh, I, it, another thing I did for a long time here was I was an advisor for a club called Collegiate Deca. And Collegiate Deca is a leadership and marketing and management type of club for students to build their leadership skills. It's a, it's a national organization. We're a chapter We're still going on here at FIT. Um, Dee Dee Valentini, who, who hired me, um, asked me, she said, listen, I've done it for six years. Can you take over and you'd be good with the students? And would you like it? And they, they travel on a conference every year into a different city. And you know, it's all about leadership skills and managing issues. You'd be just right for it. So I said, sure. So I took it over. I was there for like 16 years as the advisor for that club. We went to cities all over America every spring. Mm -hmm. In the fall, we had a conference here in New York, which was really very, very informative to the students. And it was really great to see the students grow and change. I'd have students come in as freshmen and work out as like professionals come senior year, right? Four years of that club could change them. They got jobs, you know, they met people on these trips, they networked with people. It was really, really a great club to be part of. You know, and I still get involved with the students who join it, and I still encourage students to join it. I met so many great people from other campuses, advisors and faculty going to those conferences. 1,500 students, hundreds of faculty and advisors meeting, um, you know, professors from all over uh, the country. Uh, it, it was always very informative, going to seminars and little conferences that they would have, and you know. So you know, the other thing I'm privileged to have is, you know. I have my bachelor's and years of college, you know, a little more than four years because I went to all these different mm-hmm. transfers, and then my master's, you know. Um, but I have 27 years of college right here. You know, I, I've been learning here for 27 years, right? It's like a 27 year degree. I mean, you don't get a degree for it, you know. I have a title, professor. Right. <laughs> but, but, y- I have been learning from faculty, from students, from other faculty on other campuses. It's, it's just an amazing experience, you know? Um, just, you know, totally, you know, who knew, you know, that this kind of thing could, could kind of happen like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I've worked for a great president. Joyce has been immensely... Uh, influential on this campus to change so much in the physical plant and our academic programs and uh, social justice department and, mm-hmm. and council on uh, ci- you know civility and diversity and equity and inclusion just two councils you know sustainability council and um, council for diversity council uh, and a department for diversity, equity, inclusion, all these things are you know, incredibly important for today's uh, society. There are things that are happening and changing. Um, I think she's been really good for the campus. Got us, got us a new building, which we'll be moving into soon. It wasn't easy to get 200 million mm-hmm. as one of 64 campuses. Not easy, you know, but. Yeah. What are your dreams or plans for the future? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I love to travel to Greece every summer. We go to Greece every summer, so I'm going to continue to do that. We have a three-week trip planned for this summer. My wife is from Greece, born and raised in Greece, Kalamata, southern coast. So she has sisters there and family and cousins and everyone else. And um, it is a great place to visit. Uh, So we go there, usually four weeks every summer. 
One of our dreams is to spend three months in an island, mm -hmm. more of a remote island. Mm -hmm. Another one of our dreams is to spend um, a year in an island, a full year, like to see what the winter's like, because the Mediterranean can get pretty nasty in the winter. So that would be a challenge. Um, but to do that year, I would need uh, to retire. This is the conundrum, mm -hmm. because I don't want to retire. Everyone asks me, so many people I know my age have retired, my neighborhood, we go to Greece, all the fellows that would sit around the table, they're all retired. Right. I'm the only one working, my friends on Long Island, they're retiring, my neighbors, you know, I'm like still working. You know, a few of us, a few of us, a couple of fellows I know are lawyers or maybe in the financial sector or something, they're still working, but I'm among the few that are still working at 74 here. So. Every time I sit with a financial advisor, so Mr. Vesselheim, as we play out your financials, uh, when are you, when are you, what, what's the year of your retirement? I'm like, I don't think I am going to, you know. <laughs> I, listen, I worked across the hallway from Dr. Sloan. You might have had a oral uh, videotape with Dr. Sloan. But, um, you know, he was here 50 years, and he, I think he was 95 when he left, you know. I mean, I, I, I couldn't keep up with him when he walked down the hall. He was very spry and youthful. And he just loved teaching, and he says it keeps me young. And I, I feel the same thing. You know, I, I learn from my students; they inspire me. Um, it's great to see them grow and change, and to um, uh, uh, come away from you know a fifteen-week experience uh, having gained something, right? And 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 I and I hear back from them, and and I help them with their resumes, and I help them find jobs, and. Uh, help write them, you know, letters of recommendation and, and things like that. And they go on to law school or they go into, you know, some other business school or whatever they're going to do. And, you know, it's just great to see that. And, and I, I feel like I'm contributing to society by working. Um, interestingly enough, my, my brother-in-law, who's maybe two years older than me, um, just retired, you know, and my sister's all going crazy because she doesn't know what to do with him around the house and he's driving her crazy and, and my wife and I were laughing yesterday because she had my wife on the phone and and uh, he just retired last August. She goes, it hasn't even been a year yet and if I don't kill him... <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I don't want to be like that. I just want to contribute to society to change. And I love coming to New York. You know, I'm a Long Island guy, but I love coming to the city. I've been commuting on the Long Island Railroad for years. It's gotten better. Um, I don't have to take the subway. I walk down from Penn Station. You know, our schedule allows us, you know, to, to you know, push our courses into like a three-day program. I teach online some courses. So, it, you know, it has a lot of flexibility and benefits and I can work from home I work from home so much it, but it's comfortable to work from home but I get a lot done you know mm -hmm. and I, I can pace myself and you know years ago I would teach six courses a semester wow. you know now I'm down to four I had four in a day and two at night you know and I was teaching still like I said as assistant dean so but um, I teach a summer course you know it, it, summer's long you know it, but if you teach a summer course it keeps you fresh halfway through the summer before you go, you know, summer brain dead, you know, mm -hmm. on the beach. You know, after a while, I'm bored on the beach in Greece, you know. I love Greece, but, you know, you, you can stare out at the water in the sky for so long and you start to say, I, I got to do something, right? So I, I'm a high-strung guy in that respect. And, and by the way, because I said I was raised, you know, building things, doing things, fixing things, you know, I'm talented in that way. I need to do things, right? I, I like to do things. And so I'm always busy around the house. I'm always fixing things. And years ago, I used to fix cars and all that kind of thing. But, you know, still woodwork is my passion. I like to always, you know, do that kind of thing. So that keeps you, like, wanting to do things. I mean, you have um, that kind of, um, uh, I guess, drive, if you want to call it. But I don't think I'll ever retire. Um, maybe more traveling, obviously, besides Greece. Listen, I've been to all kinds of places. We've been to Italy and France. and you know, Sweden and all, all kinds of things, and I'd like to go to other countries, and so, you know, more travel, mm -hmm. you know, would, would be good. Um, so, yeah, Greece has been really special to me, uh, because um, when I met my wife, I think I was 21, and she was here in the States uh, going to school at Nassau Community College, so it happens. And she had come to the States and lived in Kansas City, Missouri, with an old uncle. Mm. And she hated it. She came all by herself at 18. And she hated it. And 
I came back to New York and found a couple of other cousins, and they said, stay here and go to school. So she did. She didn't go back home. She was about to go back home. They convinced her to stay. And so I got to know those cousins and stuff. And it was because she made that move that um, that's how I got to know her. And so here's a funny story. Long before dating apps and all that kind of stuff, I met my wife on a blind date because my sister introduced us. And so um, when I say blind date, I didn't even have a picture or anything. And so, <laughs> so, um, and it, it was so weird. It's six degrees of separation. My house in the back was a, a, a Greek lady who had moved in. My mother got to know her, brought her a pie that she baked, got to know her. They were friends forever. She'd go there, like they had a ladies' night every uh, once a month on a Thursday. All these Greek ladies would show up. My mother thought it was hysterical because, you know, she's a Polish lady. You know, here she is with all these Greek ladies, and they're having a blast. No men. And so she, uh, one night, my sister goes over, and it so happened that Effie ended up over there. And so, there's a little network, you know. And so my sister goes, I met this nice Greek girl. You should go out on a date. <laughs> I said, no, I hate blind dates. So she goes, I'll pay for it. And I said, all right. So I went on the blind date. So she literally paid for it. But here's another funny story. So when we, when we finally you know, have this uh, dating thing, um, we say to my parents and my sister, we're going to get married. My sister goes, are you sure? I didn't think it was going to come to that. <laughs> you were going to get married? So I was like, yeah. So now all this time I never met her family in Greece. None of them. Like Zippo, zero. I knew her cousins, one or two, two of them. So we get married here. My, my dad and my mom throw a big wedding with all the family. I'm a big family, right? Catholic church, big wedding. Um, yeah, ceremony, everything. And that night we, literally that night we traveled to Greece. My first time on a plane, 1973. Wow. First time we were a plane. Never flew anywhere. So, international flight, TWA, we're on the plane. They call out our name. We're like, why are they calling our name? They brought us champagne. Oh. Those are the times are different. Mm -hmm. So, so um, we go to Greece. I meet, meet her family for the first time. Now we're married, okay? Meet her family. So, and we bring a big picture, you know, of us or whatever. Anyway, we, we presented this. So it was really nice meeting her family, small house and everything, huge family. And guess what? We get married again the following Saturday in the Greek ceremony, in the Greek church, mm -hmm. all over again. <laughs> this time it's this place that sits up on the bluff overlooking the Mediterranean. It's out there at night under the stars, full moon. It was spectacular. I'm like, I didn't know a place like this could exist, okay? <laughs> the blue water, I mean, the water looked blue at night. I mean, it was amazing, especially when the lights shine. But it was amazing. Uh, we had such a great wedding. Uh, met all her cousins and family. It was so much fun. She's one of three girls. and. Um, Lots of cousins and things, and we've had we've been over there so many years, so many years, uh, you know, in the islands, and it's just changed my life. A lot, most people think I'm Greek by now, you know. Mm -hmm. Most people, it, it, the name Vassilati is very similar to a lot of Greek names, Vassiliadis and mm -hmm. you know, or Vassilotis and all these different things, and Vassilis and stuff. But it's you know, the Greeks occupied southern Italy. My Italian family is from uh, east of Naples, in a, a place called Riccia. Um, and uh, I've never been to that part of Italy, but I'd like to go. But, um, yeah. So, All right. I'm talking a lot. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the point of this. Uh, finally, what would you most like for people to remember about you so far? Okay. Well, listen, uh, I think one of the things is I'm curious. I'm, a, I'm, I'm always thinking about ideas, new ideas. I think I'm a bit of a change agent. I think I'm a bit of a catalyst for change. Um, I drop a lot of ideas and change ideas to people. And it um, doesn't mean I'm going to execute them, but other people might. And it's okay if they get the credit and all that other good stuff. I'm good with it. Um, uh, we started talking about a graduate program in FBM a long time ago with John Mincarelli. And uh, we kept talking about it and talking about it. And it, in those days, it was kind of crazy to think about a graduate program at FIT. And I'm like, why not? You know? And so John one day said, hey, you know, Rob, um, this idea has really, really got me here. I, I'm, this is, I'm going to, 
I got to do a lot of work on this. I'm attacking this. I'm like, go for it. You know, go for it. Go. You know, knock yourself out. Mm-hmm. And 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 you know, but I don't know. I, I just feel like I like to plant ideas of change and ideas of uh, directional need uh, to a lot of people on campus. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody on campus and anybody anywhere in my town. I'm constantly communicating with leadership in my town for change, and I think I've had a lot of influence on changing people in Garden City. Um, I feel, you know, I have a deep creativity in many ways, a, a kind of a business creative mind, and that's what I'd like to try to bring to my students is the idea that they're in a business major, but it's a creative business major, mm-hmm. creative problem solving, creative decision making, um, and you know, creativity is not always about pretty colors and, and uh, you know, fancy kind of things, but it, the reality is that um, I've always thought I've been, you know, kind of fair and honest to people and uh, worked hard. Worked hard. I'm not afraid of hard work. Oof. <laughs> I'm telling you. I've restored three houses or four. I don't even know. Three? Three houses. My daughter's, our first house, a 1920s house in Floral Park. My house now, 1926 home, we stored them. Um, done all kinds of things that demanding, hard work kind of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm hoping that the 150 foot, 150 foot brick pathway that I built in my first house is still there. I think it is. <laughs> 150 feet of brick pathway, mm-hmm. right? About two feet wide, meandering through the backyard all the way to the back corner of our yard in our house. I've written it brick by brick. Um, as I was working full time, by the way, <laughs> and having two little kids, <laughs> and you know, I get out there before leaving to work to put a few bricks in, and it took like all summer. But it, those kinds of pro- I'm not afraid of those kinds of projects, you know, and, and those kinds of things, you know, rebuilding an old, you know, Alfa Romeo sports car and fixing it up and all those kinds of things. But um, uh, I love building things, you know, and, and the funny thing is, learning from my father was a shop teacher. Industrialized woodwork, in the mid, and he was in the middle schools in Queens, Van Wyck Junior High School, Queens, uh, Junior High School 217. Learning woodwork is, is an amazing thing because it, it's planning. You know, it's all about planning. You have to sketch something out. You have to measure it all. You have to cut the wood. You have to plan the wood. Which wood? How long do you have the wood? How do you cut the wood? How do you get it all ready? So you're putting this whole puzzle together first, and then you have to put it in pieces, and they have to put it together. And so it's a lot like pattern making. And interestingly enough, I was also asked to run pattern making for two years in the school. Wow. While we were transitioning from the pattern making major to the pattern making certificate and bringing in technical design as a bachelor's program. If you don't think that was a crazy two years of transition, whoo, yeah. faculty were ready to jump out the windows. They thought their jobs and careers were over. People who had put their whole life into pattern making. But pattern making was changing as a degree. It was no longer a degree, it was a certi- we're going to make a certificate. So we had to change physical classrooms all over the campus that they had. They had these massive ca- classrooms that we were going to take back and chop into three other kinds of classrooms. We had to clear them out. We cleared out several rooms. Then we had to redo other rooms with all this new equipment. There's still three new pattern making rooms, I call them new, on this campus that, you know, Basically, with the faculty, we helped to design and build, and it came out great. And they're, and they're, and they're uh, still functioning today with all the new equipment. And, um, and they look great, and they function well. And, and I'm proud of those three rooms. But it was a crazy time to, to do that. Um, and at the same time, I was still teaching an FBM. All right? Right. OK. And so I think I got release time of like one course to, to do that or something. and then. Juggling night courses, uh, pattern making, and then trying to deal with all the students whose programs were ending, right? It was really, and they had to graduate by a certain time and finish their courses because the program, it was a nightmare. But we got it done. It was a challenge. I, I like challenges. I like challenges. All right. Is there anything left that you'd like to say? Uh, anything or? left? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, I love. Food. I love to eat. I love great restaurants and things. Um, but the food in Greece is spectacular. Um, I'm partial to Greek food, Italian food, French food. Um, and, you know, 
there was a question about books, and I'm not going to speak to specific authors or books per se, although I might mention one here or there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's I think interesting when somebody says, you know, what's your favorite book and things like that, um, or what book influenced you, and, mm -hmm. you know, I think you have to look at it as in eras of time, right? So, you know, when I was like a little kid, okay, my house was full of books. A lot of other houses weren't. Okay, they had like a few Reader's Digest books that were on the shelf someplace. Why was my house full of books? Because my dad loved books, right? He had saved every book he ever bought. He also had a lot of specialized books on woodworking and the techniques. I have some classics, first editions, amazing things. Um, he also would, he was in schools from the time he was a young man teaching in Brooklyn. And a lot of these schools were renovating and bringing themselves up, and what would they do? Renovate the library. They would discard all these books. Discard stamps, he would take them home. I had every book I think I ever looked at as a child, I had a discard stamp in it from a library, from different schools in Brooklyn and Queens. But we had this immense library of books, and it was just great to look through all these books. Right? And, and, um, and then we had you know, a subscription to like National Geographic. What a great thing you know, to learn about the world. So different eras of time, right? Different eras of time. You know, you start, you know, your teachers are assigning you the Iliad and the Odyssey, and then you're, you're reading, you know, a Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and then you're reading, you know, the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which made me want to travel, you know, and, 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 and think about the world, and, and it was an amazing book. Um, so certain books, like, hit me at certain times. As a younger kid, The Call of the Wild, I want my grandson to read. I have two grandchildren, a little guy, Alex, and a little girl, Effie. I, I, I wanted to read The Call of the Wild, Captain's Courageous. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is that you know, books hit you at different points in your life. And to say that there's not one book, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was spectacular, wrote one of his bi read one of his biographies. I, I, I toured Theodore Roosevelt's home in, in, in Oyster Bay when I was a kid like three times. It immensely influenced me to see this man's history and his life. Um, and, uh, you know, Roosevelt Field Shopping Center is named after his son, who lost, was lost in the war, in World War I. But, um, so, um, you know, reading books about Bill Gates, uh, Jack Welch, one of the great CEOs, you know, businesses, books on business of all kinds. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 and interestingly enough, you'd be surprised how much you can learn by reading a good student research papers. Um, but you also read a lot for your, for, you know, I've read so many books on leadership and, and, and management and team building um, that uh, you know, I, I, made, I had a course in team building uh, that was you know, one of my favorite courses, team management. Um, and you know, there was a great book on leadership, uh, leadership skills of the West Point, you know, West Point. Um, but, uh, you know, so I've taught courses in buying, in, in, in fashion merchandising, uh, introduction to fashion, uh, dynamics in retail careers. Um, now the sustainability course um, um, and uh, contemporary retail management course, but you're reading a lot for these courses, right? You're reading a lot, and um, um, so yeah, um, I think reading is still important. I try to I try to encourage my students to read. Every every class I go to, I bring my I have a cart, and on the cart must be ten or twelve books that I bring to them and say, hey, it's a great one to read. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. You want to read a powerful book? It's one of the biggest selling books in the world. Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl saw the Holocaust in the concentration camps and wrote about the psychological impact of being in a, psycho, in, a, in, a, in a camp like that. Powerful, powerful book. I always wanted to read it. And one day, we were moving my daughter into her dormitory at Villanova. And as we move her in, it was at night, it was late, it was pouring rain, in, in the water, in the front of the, in the front of the doors going in is, is the book. It's all soaking wet. Some other kid dropped it. I say it's soaking wet. You know who's who's gonna figure out whose book this is, right? It's like ten o'clock at night. I pick up this soaking wet book. I, That's the book I'm gonna read. I threw it in the trunk of the car, dried out. It got all wrinkled up, and I read it just like that. And it, it was so powerful. And and I would tell students time and time again, you got to read that book. And. Um, 
you know, uh, so now, now my students read Fashionopolis by Dana Thomas, all about the sustainable uh, apparel uh, world. And, and they love that book, and it's a really powerful book. She spoke at a sustainability conference recently, and she was a very good speaker, um, and, and I met with her. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, I think the idea of this is, is, is brilliant. Um, the fact that you're going to have this uh, uh, archive of so many people that have come through these doors is, is a really wonderful thing. And you have to remember that if, if you're interviewing faculty in this moment like this, uh, I think what's missing is how much we talk and speak and influence our students in the classroom. And I think if we're putting together a good lecture, um, they come away with something. You know? mm -hmm. So, believe it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>